studies uh, Thailand theater companies um, performance exhibit and also lecture and I hope you all uh, get a copy of the program if you did not uh, grab one that uh, maybe on your way out please uh, pick one up uh, on the back the last page there uh, it shows that uh, what we have on, uh, for these two, uh, two days today and uh, so la uh, our lunch time lecture is just the first event so tonight we have one performance and also question and answer session and tomorrow then uh, together with the exhibit we have about 20 uh, different uh, copies in the Chinese and Taiwanese tradition, starting from the beginning of the 19th century, so that's uh, more than 100 years old, and until today. So uh, it's a very nice uh, uh, way to learn about Asian puppetry. In addition to that, uh, we also have students uh, from uh, Asian club and also uh, from Asian studies, and also uh, from the World Languages and Cultural Department. They also are making uh, about 12 different panels to introduce the puppy theater from all over the world. So it includes, for example, Africa, or South Asia, including India, uh, Vietnam, and Malaysia, Indonesia, and also, of course, uh, East Asia, uh, including uh, what we already have that will be Chinese, Taiwanese tradition, but also uh, a, uh, Japan, Korea, and we also have European tradition uh, will be on exhibit tomorrow, including uh, Italy, uh, France, and Germany. So it's going to be a very nice, uh, well-rounded multicultural learning experience, and you have, can have a so-called one-stop shopping <laughs> <laughs> for your global literacy. Uh, I hope that you enjoy it, and also at the same time, find it educational as well. Uh, so, uh, so here then is outline uh, 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 today's program and the tomorrow. Tomorrow's program is our grand finale. Uh, so if you uh, have some engagement tonight, you cannot make it. Tomorrow is another opportunity. So tomorrow's show will be the last show in Swinton. And uh, together uh, with the performance that's over the same uh, show like tonight, uh, if we have time, a little bit Q&A, but then we are going to move into workshop. Uh, you get to create your own uh, Asian, Taiwanese puppet and you can also learn uh, skills from uh, Dr. Robin uh, about how to uh, play those uh, puppets. Um, so uh, tomorrow then um, is it, a wonderful other opportunity as well. So you can find all the different information on the back here. Uh, you will find that there's a little bit discrepancy uh, in about the uh, event starting time. It's done on purpose. If, uh, so here then it says about, for example, tonight, the show is going to start at the 6 o'clock p.m. sharp. Therefore, then the door open at 5.30. Okay, so you want good seating and so on and come earlier. And when you come earlier, uh, you find the seat and so on, that uh, you can also then look at the exhibit uh, before the show starts, okay? Uh, if you cannot make it that earlier, you come uh, at uh, 6 o'clock for the show, then perhaps after the show, that you can look at the exhibit. So you can do it away. So Friday too, that is uh, 5.30 sharp. We start the show, the performance on time. But the door open at 5 o'clock. That's for tomorrow, okay? Um, all right, so uh, today we uh, have our uh, speaker. That is uh, Dr. Robin. Okay, I'm gonna to try to pronounce his last name correctly in the Netherlands way. Uh, that is Wuhendale <laughs> okay, so then now, now I'm re resorting to the American pronunciation. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we will have uh, we have the honor to have uh, Dr. Robin here to uh, give us a lecture to talk about the war in the stage, and it's going to be public identity and politics in Taiwan. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's uh, Robin Rosendahl. I'm from the Netherlands, but I've been living in Taiwan for 20 years, and I'm director of the Puppet Theater Museum in Taipei and artistic director of the Puppet Theater Company. So today I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about puppets in Taiwan because puppets are very important in Taiwan, but I'll also give you some background, some historical background, and then we go to modernity. Now, in 2006, the Ministry of Information in Taiwan wanted to know what could be the best symbol to represent Taiwan. So there was a, a big public opinion poll. And uh, number three 
in the final selection was the 101 building in Taipei, which some years ago was the tallest building in the world. Uh, number two was Jade Mountain, which is the highest peak in Taiwan. And number one was Puppet Theater with 130,000 votes. So Puppet Theater is very important. And I, I will tell you uh, why it's so important in Taiwan, its relation with politics and socio-economic developments. But first I'll tell you a little bit about puppets. So why is a 50-year-old man still playing with puppets? It's a little bit worrying. Uh, because in every culture, humans make puppets, from Africa to Europe to Asia, and we make representations of people and of gods. So every form of puppet theater around the world, from Europe to Africa to Asia, started with religion. And it started with making effigies of gods that could move and that could talk. Because uh, we humans have a great need to have religion visualized. Uh, we started with making paintings, with making sculptures of gods, but you can pray to a god as much as you like. Sometimes your family members remain sick, they still die. You want to pass your exam, but you can't pass your exam. So the, we, we want the gods to be alive and to move and to talk to us. And that, that gives an enormous uh, psychological uh, comfort. And why puppets? Because puppets are made of wood or clay or stone. And we know they're dead, but they look at us. And that's sort of the magic of puppets, because they're dead, but they're still looking at you. And you've got some, that's why puppets are sometimes a little bit creepy. Uh, because, and when they move, they feel like they're alive. Now, for us modern people, it's very difficult to understand, but uh, for in, in Europe, Africa, and Asia in the past, the coming alive of the gods, the blessing, the chasing away of demons, was an amazingly important uh, fact of life. And, and I start with Europe, actually. Uh, because in Europe, where did puppets come from? From the churches, the big cathedrals that we uh, know in France, we had statues of the gods that could move with levers on the back here. And in the Middle Ages, you had Jesus who could raise his head, open his eyes, start bleeding. Uh, we had little girls, uh, prepubescent girls who didn't have their menstruation, who were standing by the side of the road like little statues of the Virgin Mary. And people would pray to them, would talk to them. And um, so the word marionette for string puppet in Europe, where does it come from? It comes from the name, it's a French word, for Marie, the name of the Virgin Mary. So the marionette, the puppets, uh, come, all come from religious uh, shows. Now in Asia, in Europe, there was the Renaissance, there was Protestantism, that were a religion against the worship of idols. So in Europe, after the Middle Ages, there was a clear uh, <coughs> separation between the religious and the secular. In Asia, this never happened. So in Asia, religion is still part of every daily life and the theater as well. It's the wrong day. So, for instance, in Nepal, we still have these young girls who still did not menstruate, who become goddesses, who you can pray to, who you can ask questions. And uh, this is the Kumari children in, in uh, Nepal. In China and Taiwan, we have the god of the theater. And these are puppets that are consecrated. So they're not puppets you put in a box. Uh, through a special ritual, they have been given a soul. So they are effectively a god. So you put him on an altar, you burn incense. Before the performance, the god is put on the altar behind the stage and prayed to. So, and these are very powerful uh, gods. This is in modern day Taipei. This is like a few years ago. Uh, there's still, oops, 
I'm learning to work this thing. Uh, Taoist priests who perform exorcisms uh, with a consecrated uh, puppet. For special rituals when people die of unnatural causes like uh, suicide or traffic accidents, uh, he calls back the soul of the deceased. If there is a new building or a new temple, this man comes with his puppet, walks through all the rooms and chases away all the demons. So this uh, amazing religious tradition that disappeared in Europe uh, is still alive in Taipei, in a modern city like Taipei and other parts of Asia. And now we're going slowly to Taiwan, but before we go to Taiwan, we first got it. We first go to the southeastern shore of China, and there is a city here. Uh, it's called Quanzhou, and a thousand years ago, that used to be the big, one of the biggest harbor in the world. Um, it was an enormous uh, center of trade. Marco Polo went there. Uh, a, a Jewish merchant named Jacob Dancona wrote a whole book about this city. There was a huge Muslim population, a huge Catholic uh, Jewish population. It was one of the biggest trade centers in, in China. At the time, uh, Taiwan here was a purely Aborigine country. So there were just Aborigine tribes uh, living there. Now, this whole trade around the coast from Chenzhou, there were thousands and thousands of ships, tradesmen. Uh, there was a whole system of bridges along the coast made of uh, granite, kilometers long, just to provide the, the, for the trade routes. So it was a very, very uh, sophisticated system of roads, ships, and of course, culture. So this is the, the biggest statue in China of Lao Tzu, the, the Chinese philosopher of the Yijing property. A huge, beautiful temples. The oldest mosque in China was there as well. And of course, if there's a huge economical base, of course, culture blooms as well. And theater, opera is one of the most important Chinese forms of entertainment. So when it was opera performed, when there were funerals, when there were weddings, when there was a god's birthday, when someone made a lot of money, you thank the gods and you have an opera performance. When uh, a ship comes in the harbor from far away, there's an opera performance. When it leaves, there's a performance. There was no television, there was no other entertainment. Theater was the biggest and most important form of theater. Actors, like in Europe, were of the lowest of the lowest classes. We find the same thing in Taiwan. Uh, prostitutes, thieves, and actors were the only people who were not allowed to take part in the imperial exams. So actors were the lowest of the lowest. We'll come back to that uh, later. And of course, apart from the actor's theater, there was the puppet theater. Now, what's the difference between the both? Uh, both the Puppets are, of course, a lot smaller. Uh, for an opera company, you need at least 12 people to perform. For a puppet theater company, two performers and a few musicians, and that's enough. So puppet theater, as uh, some Chinese scholars say, was the, the classroom of Chinese culture. Because people couldn't travel very far, they usually stayed in their own community. Um, Puppet theater brought all the ideas of, of love, death, the way the emperor looked, the way a beautiful girl should look, uh, the way a man and a woman should behave. It was a whole sort of little window on Chinese uh, culture. And puppets, you can put the whole show in two boxes, and you can go over every mountain to very remote regions, and bring the theater there. So it was, it was a very important form of art. And you have to remember, life was extremely boring in those days. Uh, we couldn't go on the internet. There was really nothing to do. So people had to make their own music. And if there's a theater show, it was an amazing experience for everybody. So this, this uh, culture in this town of Quanzhou uh, was developed into a very refined 
culture. Um, the puppets, I have here a, a, a 100 year old puppet. Uh, there were special carvers who just made the head. There are about 20 layers of paint on it. So it looks like it's made of porcelain, but it's actually made of, of wood, of camphor wood. There were special people who did the hair because the hair is made of real human hair. Every lady has a, there are 50, 60 different hairstyles. Um, so the making of the hair, there were special people who did the hair. And then there's the costume, which were made of silk. Um, there were special costume makers who made costumes for opera actors. So big costumes. But of course, if you make a big costume, there's lots of cloth left. And they were perfect to make these small uh, puppet costumes. So it's, it's a very, very uh, refined tradition. It was performed on these beautiful stages. So they were completely carved of wood. Uh, two performers were standing behind it. And if you go and see the show uh, today or tomorrow, you will see a stage like this. And the performers were looking through these wooden boards to see the puppets. So they could, performers can look outside, but you don't see them. And I will we'll show you now a little uh, clip of a performance. Now they're glove puppets, so the performance is like a ballet with the hands. You don't see the hands, but they have to move very elegantly. Now this is a young student. So it needs uh, to, for a culture to get to such a refined level, it takes not only a long time, it takes also, a, a, important is a big financial basis and an audience that can appreciate uh, such a refined art. There's an old man smoking a, a pipe. <laughs> I will tell you the trick. There's someone, there's a tube inside the puppet. There's someone under the stage who's smoking and blowing in the tube. After trying many different cigarettes, Mar Marlboro gives the best smoke. <laughs> He's slightly dizzy now. But you have to imagine that you are now a Chinese countryside 200 years ago, very poor people in very simple clothes, and you're looking at this wonderful uh, representation of high culture. So how should a girl behave and how should a girl look? And this type of performance is now 
only preserved in Taiwan. I'll explain later why that is. Okay, I'll show, this is the clown. So, every aspect of culture, of course, the laughs, the fighting, the romance, it's all in the theater. <laughs> so this really uh, amazingly uh, beautiful form of theater existed in China. And now we're going to our next, uh, next, Shaiga, what's it you can know? What's that? Um, now, Glove Puppet Theater uh, was a very open form of theater. There are some types of theater in China have a very strict iconography. You cannot change the way it's performed. Glove Puppet Theater, you see anything in the streets, something interesting, something fun your audience might like, you can incorporate it. And here we see this is, oops a 19th century uh, puppet. This is a uh, Portuguese. Uh, after the Opium War in 1840, foreigners uh, happily invaded China and took little parts of it. Uh, the Portuguese suddenly came and this was a, a, a black Portuguese. This is an Englishman, who also was incorporated in the theater. And as you know, there was no television puppet theater for kids, for adults. It was a form of uh, major entertainment. And so you also had toys for kids. These were from the 19th century. They're made of clay, but every kid had their own uh, little set of puppets. Of course, they were very cheap, but they also break very easily. So Taiwan was an aborigine society until the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, there were sometimes Chinese traders came there to buy some deer skins. Japanese came there to do a little bit of trade. But it basically was not part of any uh, organized country. Uh, the Dutch came to China at the beginning of the 17th century to trade. China was closed at the time and was not interested in any foreign trade. So uh, the Dutch try, uh, tried to trade by force and occupied islands between Taiwan and China called the Pescadores or Penghu as they're called now, built a fortress there and started uh, stealing, robbing and trying to trade. Um, now the governor of the province of Fujian uh, of course one, didn't want those Dutch there. They arranged a big fleet of 1,000 ships and chased the Dutch away. And they said, you can go to Taiwan, because Taiwan doesn't belong to anybody. You can go there, but don't stay in China. Um, so the Dutch went to Taiwan and built a huge fortress there. Uh, and they also wanted, just wanted to do business. So they tried to get Chinese people to come to Taiwan illegally, to come over and do trade which worked very well because soon there were very rich merchants living next to this fortress. A whole city was built there. Um, it was the only time in history that both Manhattan and Taiwan belonged to the same country. So they were all uh, Dutch, actually. Uh, but it was a very, very profitable uh, trade post and later the whole country, uh, uh, a colony. Um, enormous amounts of money were made because Trade with China was illegal, but there were whole fleets of pirates or merchants doing trade between Japan, uh, Taiwan, Indonesia, India. So there was enormous business going on, all illegal, all on the sea. Um, well, wherever Chinese traders go, they bring their own theater. So theater was introduced in Taiwan. This is the oldest print we have of uh, uh, a theater performance. Unfortunately, it was made by a Dutchman who had never been to Taiwan. He only received a written transcript and then he painted it from his own imagination. But uh, we see the god of the theater, the actors is praying for the god of the theater. Uh, that, and this is the stage here with uh, the performance. But theater came to Taiwan. The first immigrants to Taiwan were uh, 
many, many uh, poor peasants who were given a plot of land, who had to pay for it, and then had to pay the money back. So it was uh, a trade center with a lot of poor peasants. Now in 1662, the Dutch were kicked out. Uh, Taiwan became part of the Chinese Empire, the Qing Empire, in 1662. And Taiwan was closed off. Nobody was allowed to go there or leave. Why was that? Because Taiwan was full of pirates, of all sorts of uh, shady people. It was on the edge of the empire, so nobody could go there or go back. Only after 30, 40 years, Taiwan was opened up for emigration, also to relieve the demographic pressure in Fujian. Lots of people started emigrating to Taiwan, and they brought their art with them, which is the Glove Puppet Theater and the Actors Theater. So puppet theater became a very popular form of entertainment because if there is a temple festival, if there's any sort of celebration, puppets need to be there. And so there are several, at the time already, several hundred companies active in uh, Taiwan. Now, that lasted, uh, Taiwan, part of the, uh, the Chinese Empire until 1895, when Taiwan became a Japanese uh, colony. And the Japanese wanted to make Taiwan into a little Japan. Um, what they did was they did uh, a lot of very good things. They established a, a modern school system, elementary school system, high school and university system, uh, modern railroads, and they didn't really interfere with arts and religions. Also, there was still uh, active uh, communication with China. You, just, you could travel to China by boat. So all the puppets that were performed in Taiwan were still made in China. You could write a, a little uh, request for puppets, send it to China with money, and then the puppets uh, came back. So the, the culture, the real cultural center of the construction of puppets was still uh, in China. This uh, lasted until the 1930s when J Japan became extremely nationalist and suddenly this colony of uh, Taiwan needed to become completely Japanese. So, religious performances were forbidden. Uh, oh, you could only perform in a theater. There were only seven companies that were allowed to continue to perform. Uh, they had to perform in Japanese. The music was no longer live music, but records of Japanese music. So there was a, a sort of DJ backstage who played uh, the music. And the stages changed as well. Now here we see from 1941, uh, we saw this beautifully carved stage. The stages that were used now were uh, made of cloth, painted cloth. So they were really very big. The puppets were still very small, but the stage was really big. So it was one of the first inno big innovations, actually a, a forced innovation of, of theater in, uh, in China and in, in Japan. Um, 1945, two atomic bombs, the end of the World War, and what happened? Taiwan became part of China again. Now this created quite a problem because China was engaged in a civil war between the communists and nationalists. Taiwan was speaking Taiwanese and Japanese, so nobody understood what people at the mainlands were saying because they spoke Mandarin. Also, Taiwanese society was quite evolved at the time um, and more advanced than mainland China. So, uh, Taiwan was taken up in this turmoil of the, uh, the civil war in China. So, the nationalist government came to Taiwan and, of course, the Taiwanese were first quite happy to be back in part of China, but soon uh, there were en enormous frictions between the different uh, uh, groups of the nationalist government and the local Taiwanese, because the nationalist government took over everything of the Japanese. Thank you very much. All the companies, all the land, all the buildings, and also all the posts in the government. Um, so this, these frictions led to, in 1947, the famous uh, February 28 incident where uh, 
the nationalist government was a friction with local Taiwanese and suppressed this uh, friction with enormous violence. So several thousand people were killed. Uh, martial law was installed. And um, so, so this friction existed. And in 1949, the nationalist government was defeated and retreated to Taiwan, was standing with its, its back to the wall or it's back to the Pacific Ocean, more clearly. And they created a very, very, uh, uh, quite a brutal regime. Uh, not as brutal as in the People's Republic of China, of course, but still uh, quite repressive. So uh, there were no longer performances in temples were allowed. Uh, there was a, a great fear that communist spies would be everywhere. So the regime was slightly paranoid, which is understandable. Uh, so there was a, a huge suppression of uh, theater. Only after a few years, in the early 50s, people were allowed to perform again. But uh, performances needed to be registered. The censor needed to read what you were performing and why you were performing it. You definitely could not make any uh, political mistakes. Of course, it was a repression, but it was a mild repression. In the People's Republic of China, all religious activities were stopped immediately uh, after 1949. All the theater companies were disbanded and not allowed to perform anymore and had to all be put together in a, a national uh, companies that were controlled by the Communist Party. So in, uh, in China, this, this uh, destruction of the basic core of Chinese society was very, very intense. In Taiwan, there was some repression, but not as, as bad as in uh, China. So uh, puppeteers could continue to perform. Taiwan was a relatively open society. Uh, it was almost an American colony because they were protected by the US. If the US was not in Taiwan, there would surely be a war. So US culture, Japanese culture, all came to Taiwan. Comic strips, movies, and the theater, as I said before, the puppet theater uses everything that is fun or interesting and the audience might like. So the first thing was the stages became very uh, kitschy, you could say. The colors, they were very, uh, very bright. And as we saw in the Japanese period, you had these painted cloth stages. And it's interesting that this innovation was continued. So in Taiwan now, there are still 300 companies and they all perform with, on stages like this. These cloth stages, they're not so expensive as the carved ones. <clears throat> now, the puppets changed as well. So, if you have uh, a hundred year old puppet, this character is a clown character. He's sort of a playboy type of uh, always chasing women and being a little bit naughty. So, this is a 100 year old puppet. Here is in in Taiwan in the, in the 50s, he's already, you see his clothes has changed, so a bit more colorful. Here in the 60s, he's getting a new hairstyle, so a little bit more uh, fashionable. And in the 70s, he's completely like a pig, you see, with a pig nose, pig's ears. So uh, in Taiwan, as it's called Ito Zhu, huh? It's a sort of playboy type. So the puppets changed and they became bigger and bigger. Now, why was that? Because uh, Puppet Theater is a, their company. You're competing with many, many other companies. The bigger your puppets, the more people can see them. The bigger your stage, the more noise you make, the more uh, business you have. So. Uh, Companies were evolving all the time. And of course, at the time when there was no television, every kid wanted to have a, a set of puppets to play with and fight over it, as you can see here. So in the South, there were all these, all these companies that were performing with these big puppets. Really, uh, we can see a little I'll show you a, sh a short clip of one of these shows. Uh, 
The smoke cannons are used, lasers, explosions, anything can be used. Uh, this is backstage. And the backdrops are on a turntable so they can turn around. So this development is, is uniquely Taiwanese. It can't be found anywhere in China. It's a, but the authorities really didn't like this type of theater. So the theater that was promoted was this as the of original Chinese culture, traditional culture. And also in children's books, here we see a traditional performance uh, which very much promotes this type of theater. And there's even a foreigner here who's studying it. So it's to express its uh, importance. And this is the theater in the south. And here you see all the people are complaining. Uh, there's a lot of noise. Explosions here are made. And no longer live music. Uh, in the 50s already the music was made by a DJ. So there's one person sitting behind the stage, about 100 records, two turntables, and they're changing the, the music all the time. And any music can be used. So the most popular one is still the theme of Hawaii 5 I don't know if you know the series, but it's definitely still the most popular. Uh, from Dolly Parton to Cindy Lauper to Japanese popular music, anything can be used. If the DJ thinks, or oh, there's a girl coming out, hey, I put on some Dolly Parton or something. Nobody understands what they're singing anyway, but it sound, if it sounds right, it's, it's okay. So it's a, a very postmodern way of uh, doing a, a performance. Now, something very important happened with the introduction of television. Um, because uh, television in Taiwan, because we're still on martial law, we're in the early, late 60s, early 70s, where people were not allowed to have a broadcast in Taiwanese. Now, Taiwanese is the language that 80% of the population speaks. All, all broadcasts were in Mandarin, Chinese. Now, every day there was one half hour that was allowed for Taiwanese. Uh, now, in that half hour, there was a man named uh, Huang Junxiong who uh, did a puppet show. And this puppet show became amazingly popular. How popular did it become that when this show was on, the whole of the Taiwanese economy came to a standstill. People, kids did not go to school. Everybody watched this show. So it's like really amazing uh, success. That was also why the show was forbidden to be performed on television. For the same reason that theater in China since a thousand years is forbidden because people do, do not do their work, they all get together and they watch uh, puppets or opera. So this is one of the earliest sort of uh, very crude way it was performed, but everybody loved it. And these are the three most important characters that every Taiwanese knows. Uh, this is the hero of the show. Uh, and you see the puppets are already changed. Uh, the traditional Chinese beauty is very thin, beautiful eyes. And here we already have the influence of uh, Western uh, performances. In Asia, eyes are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, Japanese comic eyes are now this big, if you know Jap Japanese manga. Uh, so big eyes is a new invention. Uh, this is Suyan Bun, this is Neng Ki, his uh, sort of clown sidekick and Liu San. Amazing. So everybody in Taiwan knows these because of the television. Now, it was banned, but the deed had been done. Everybody was crazy about it. So the man who started it, Huang Junxiong, start, oops, hey, yo, uh, started performing outside. And you see the kind of crowds he drew. 
it was amazingly popular. So you had products with the puppets on it, you had toys with the puppets on it. It was really popular. So after some time, it was still allowed on TV. And this is Mr. Huang Junxiu. It's the only puppeteer in the world who drives a Ferrari. Um, because they make an am amazing amount of money, so they're very rich and very successful. But this is in the early days, so he also uh, brought out his own records. And there, were, there are about 300 puppet records in Taiwan that could be used by the different companies. So if you're a poor company in the countryside, you could use his record, which sounded really good, and have a, uh, the same style. Now, everything was used in puppet theater, as I said. So also in Taiwan, you have striptease puppets. This is very unique. Already in the 70s, they existed. So sometimes uh, in, with, uh, in the countryside, you have a puppet striptease and people uh, person striptease at the same time. So, so the, go the taste of the gods changes with the taste of the people. So it's uh, a very lively art. Now, we're, we're, as I said, we were in the 70s with television. Uh, Taiwan started to, to slowly uh, getting into its democracy phase. So in 1987, martial law was lifted, and there was enormous interest started to bloom in Taiwanese local culture. You could, for the first time, really express that. People started to get interested in theater, puppets. They started to study it. And the famous Taiwanese director Ho Xiaoxian made a movie about, it's called The Puppet Master, about Li Tianlu. And almost overnight he became a national celebrity. Uh, foreigners, Taiwanese, all started to study with him. And there was a sort of intellectual strain of interest in this local culture. As I said before, puppet theater belongs to the lowest of the lowest culture. So you never want your daughter to marry any of these people, basically. Um, but intellectuals finally started to get some more interest in this. Uh, there's still a stigma to uh, glove puppet theater, but there was more interest. So on the one hand, you had this television thing that was huge, and you had a sort of more intellectual uh, interest. So the puppets started to change to grow, uh, the Huang Junxiong established a company which is called P Pili in the south of Taiwan. Uh, they built the biggest puppet film studio in the world. You can park a Boeing 747 inside. Uh, they founded the Pili television station. So Taiwan's the only country in the world with a 24-hour puppet TV station. It's very popular. And the puppets started to change again. As I said, in the 70s, the eyes were getting bigger. Uh, now we're following a Korean uh, television star's plastic surgery, which is very popular. Uh, now, what's plastic surgery? There are several things that are important. First, you have to make your eyes bigger. Then your nose a little bit pointier. Not in my case, but for the... And the shaving of the chin is, uh, so you get a, a girl like this and you go into a nice pointed chin, a little bigger nose. Now the puppets, as you see, are getting bigger, but their noses are getting uh, pointier, their chins are getting pointier. So they follow uh, fashion and changes in, uh, in culture. Now these puppet characters are amazingly popular, so students, do cosplay, costume play, it's a Japanese word. And you dress up like your favorite character and a special events. They're professional cosplay people who go to events because they're permanently the puppet character. Um, special books are published about the weapons of the puppets, thick books like this, about their clothes. There are about 200 websites where you discuss what the zodiac signs of the puppet might be, or their blood group, or what, kind, and in relation to the character. So it goes very, very far. Now, the puppet products are available in every 7 Eleven and convenience store in Taiwan. There are 4,500 4, 7 Elevens in Taiwan, where daily there are about 500,000 people using them. Uh, 
and they're confronted with uh, a puppeteer. This is on the cash register of a normal 7-Eleven in Taipei. So you can buy a puppet DVD, uh, you can buy puppet telephone cards, uh, the, the craziest thing. There's a whole line of products. So every day, everybody is confronted with puppet theater. And every new show is here. The new show here is the decisive Thunderbolt. Now, uh, computer companies, there are several big computer companies like Acer and Asus. If they have a product launch, you can use these uh, special uh, people who come with uh, huge puppet heads of one of the pop most popular characters and to promote the uh, product. Now we're coming to the politics. As we saw, there were, before there was some, uh, uh, let's say, performances were forbidden, television was forbidden, but puppet theater became sort of the Taiwanese symbol of culture. As I said, in 2006, it was selected as the most representative thing of Taiwanese culture. Why, wh why is that? Because this type of puppet theater, it's not from China, it's not from Japan, it was a really very indigenous Taiwanese culture. So if you have a puppet on your hand, you have the whole of Taiwanese culture on your hand. And so for politicians, it's very important to uh, show yourself with a puppet. So every politician, uh, this is our President Ma with a puppet of himself here. And especially during campaigns, you go to all the puppet theater companies and you make sure that there is a new segment where you, where you hold a puppet. Uh, it's also important for, uh, because in Taiwan there's still the, the, let's say, the difference between the people who came from mainland China and the people who were born in Taiwan. And basically they're sort of between party lines, the Nationalist Party and the DPP. And especially people who were from outside of Taiwan or born outside Taiwan, need especially need to identify themselves with the puppets, like President Ma, but he does a great job here. And this is the Huang Junxiong, the old master. But every politician has to do it. So we also have here uh, Xie Changting of the DPP. And he's actually the only pu puppet uh, politician who can actually perform and performs very well. He came to our museum. And this is another DPP presidential candidate. Also, she was born in Taiwan, but very, not very familiar with Taiwanese culture at all because most of the time she spends in, spend in the US. Uh, so she also has to uh, be shown with uh, puppet theater. And puppet theater also appears in cartoons. This is former president Li Denghui. Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, the Li Denghui uh, puppet theater company. And he's thinking, which candidate shall I support? The TPP candidate or the Kuomintang, the nationalist candidate? And it goes further that in the National Assembly in Taiwan, there are also puppet shows performed, uh, sometimes to make a point. So the National Assembly in Taiwan is a very lively place. Uh, so uh, here is uh, a criticism of the vice president in the form of a puppet of a puppet show. Now I said uh, the relationship with China has completely normalized. So in before 1949, all these puppets would come from China to Taiwan. And now it's exactly the same. So Taiwanese businessmen go to China, establish a factory there to make puppets, and they're sold again in uh, Taiwan. So there's a very open uh, climate. Some of the modern puppets, I brought some here, are Chairman Mao and Chiang Kai-shek. So these were, these were made in China uh, for the market in Taiwan. Uh, of course, Mao Zedong is not allowed to be se sold in China. That would be sacrilege. Uh, but they're made in China, and uh, we have them in seven colors. <laughs> it's also uh, uh, so. Uh, it's very interesting to see how uh, culture makes some circles. So before 1949, there was a normal 
relationship with China, and now it's, things have normalized again. Uh, it's also interesting to see how governments from a thousand years ago and now are always afraid that performances and even these uh, cute little puppets might influence the people and create unrest. So it's a, a very interesting thing. So as I said, puppet theater in Taiwan is, is, is very unique, and that's why it was selected as the symbol of uh, the country. And let me show one last photo. This was the former president, Chen Shui-bian, who is now in prison. But for his first presidential campaign, he also had a special puppet made. And uh, it's now a very collector's item. So you see, it's a, it's, it's a very interesting and lively, uh, lively culture. OK, my talk is until this point. And thank you very much. And I hope you have some questions. I can hardly see you because of the lights. So. Oh, that, ah, there you are. Uh, yeah, there's a basic training pro program. You go to a master and you study for three years and four months. So in the early days of puppeteer for sort of in the lower class, what would make people want to go into puppeteering? Uh, you were usually the people were living in sort of environment of traditional musicians, Taoist priests puppeteers, actors, and if you came from such a background, you could uh, go into puppet theater. Um, was it like, economically good for them, or was it just like Well, it's, it was, you had very little choices, so you, you, you know, you, it was, uh, many people were living on the edge of uh, survival, so, you know, getting, learning a trade, and for, for theater companies in China, the ch children were just bought and sold, so you bought Ten children, and you trained them to become performers. So it was a uh, with puppet theater, you had more of a let's say a, a, a training apprenticeship. So it, was, it wasn't too bad. You were still lower class, but at least you had a you learned a trade. Um, Western puppeteer in the last time you they had the uh, the puppeteer up here, and then they had the string and then the puppet. Yeah. Yeah, they have it all over China and in Taiwan. But uh, because pup glove puppets are the, the major, so I didn't go into the string puppets. Uh, absolutely, I wrote my PhD on it, so <laughs> <laughs> I've seen them. What brought you to Taiwan? Well, I, I lived in China before, so I did my uh, four years in China. I did my field work in the countryside in China. And I came to Taiwan and I really liked it. So, yeah, I would never be able to do this kind of work in China. It would be impossible. Well, I had to study Chinese society. So I had to, you know, what makes Chinese people tick or what is Chinese culture. So I wanted to choose a window on society that, and this includes. Uh, religion, music, literature, and it's theater for the people. So everybody, people watch it. So it means, it's a, theater is very democratic. If nobody watches, it's gone. So it means it's very much alive and it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful art. So that was the main reason I. Yeah, well, sorry, welcome to the performance because it's, uh, it's a really nice performance and it's got very nice live music as well. So if you don't like puppets, you can close your eyes and just listen. <laughs> and if you like both, it's even, more, it's even better. That's yeah. right, that's right. So we have uh, three musicians uh, play live and then we have three puppeteers play behind the stage and so on. So it's going to be very democratic, interactive, and... Uh, well, it's a very fun show. It's very fun. It's, it's, a, fun it's a show without words, so everybody will 
understand the action. So it's with humor, sex, and violence. So it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>